live. I'm so excited to have you join us online today for this special edition of our Easter service. I'd like to take this moment to invite you to ask your friends, your family friends to share this page. Those who are watching on YouTube as well, feel free to share the page as well. I'd like to encourage you because today we're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and we cannot take it lightly. We need to celebrate it. We need to be excited because there's something that Christ did on the cross that we need to always remind ourselves of because it's the reason why we are living, is the reason why we have a hope for the future. So go ahead and share this page um, with your friends and family as we're going through God's word today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So just have a, we're just going to have a brief couple of minutes of um, worship before we go into the word of today. And the song that's just been on my heart is the word, is a song that goes like this. I've been titled the song is Celebrate. So just sing along if you know the, the, the lyrics. And if you don't, just, uh, just enjoy it to the best of your ability. So here we go. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Do, 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 do. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. He is risen, He is risen, and He lives forevermore. He is risen, He is risen. Come on, let's celebrate. Come on, let's celebrate. Come on, let's celebrate. The resurrection of our Lord. Celebrate. Jesus, celebrate. Do, 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 do. Celebrate. Jesus, celebrate. He is risen, He is risen, and He lives forevermore. He is risen, He is risen, come on let's celebrate, hallelujah. The resurrection of our Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We are excited today to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ because it is He who's made it possible for us to be reconciled to God. But what I want us to focus on today is not just a tradition of just celebrating the Easter um um, it's the moment of knowing that Christ died and was resurrected from the cross But we need to understand what he actually did Because sometimes you can get carried away with the tradition of Yes, it's Easter, let's celebrate the resurrection of our Lord But do we sometimes take time out to really appreciate that which he did for us on the cross? What Christ did for you is no joke And you need to really take time out to really meditate on what he's done for you And what that means for your eternal destiny So with that being said, we're going to go to God's word today To look at the state of man before Christ And to look at the state of man after Christ But Christ came into the world And because he came, he made a difference to the state of man And he made a difference to the destiny of man That's what we're going to look at today So to help me expand on this I would like us to go to the book of um, 1 Thessalonians that's what we're going to start our reading from today. First Thessalonians chapter 5, and I'm going to read from verse 23. And it reads, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen for, for you, for he, for, for, for he who calls you is faithful. Now let's stop right there. Now, notice in this text that we just read, in verse 23, it reads like this. Now, may the God of peace, who, now, sorry, now, may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit, and may your soul, and may your body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Now, the reason why I'm elaborating on that scripture is because we need to understand the state of man before Christ came. And we need to understand the state of man after Christ came came, died, and was resurrected. So in this text, we can see something very clear. Man is a tripod being. Man is a spirit, he has a soul, and he lives in a body. Man is a tripod being. Before Christ came, man was and still is a tripod being. He's a spirit, he possesses a soul, and he lives in a body. When Christ came, man was still a spirit, 
he possesses a body and he um, so he possesses a soul and he lives in the body now the interesting thing that we see in the scripture is that it gives us a picture of what makes man man what man consists of and that is something that we need to pay close attention to because then we can start to appreciate what Christ did for us on the cross so with that being said I want to take us on a journey today we're going to come back to the scripture in a minute um, but notice whilst whilst we're here let me just quickly share something that just came to my mind just now man was a, is a spirit he possesses a soul and is in the body and when Christ our Lord Jesus Christ came guess what he is a spirit he has he had a body and he possessed a soul as well because he came like man it came in the form of man that is something that's very significant that we must pay close attention to as we move on in our text today so let's have a look at the book of Luke Luke chapter um, 16 Luke chapter 6 I'm going to be reading from verse 19 all the way to 31 Luke chapter 16 verse 19 all the way to 31 and it reads Jesus said, There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen, and who lived each day in luxury. At his gates lay a poor man named Lazarus, who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's stable, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried and his soul went to the place of the dead, otherwise known as Hades. There, in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember, that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he's here being comforted and you are currently in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here and no one can cross over to us from there. Then the rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers and I want him to warn them so they can repent so i want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment and abraham said moses and the prophets so abraham said moses and the prophets have warned them your brothers can read what they wrote the rich man replied no father abraham but if someone is sent from the dead then they will repent of their sins and turn to god and abraham said if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't listen even if someone rises from the dead. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. We're talking about his death, his resurrection, your victory. That's the title of this message. His death, his resurrection, your victory. Now, when we look at this picture, we see so much that we can learn from and so much examples of what is important in our daily lives. We see something very powerful because we see this parable was taught by Jesus to illustrate some spiritual truth to us. And one of the things that we see here is the rich man and the poor man. The life story of the rich man and the poor man and the great difference that they made on earth and the great difference they made whilst they uh, departed from this earth. Now, one of the things I'd like to point your attention to in this text that we just read is this. The rich man represents the world that we live in today whereby the focus of our lives is predominantly on what we can acquire, what we need for ourselves, what makes us feel good, and it's all about me, 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 me. But the poor man was a man who didn't have much while he was alive on earth. He was a struggling man. The Bible talks about dogs came to lick his wounds. That tells you his predicament was not very pleasant. And the rich man couldn't care less about the poor man. He saw him every day when he came outside to his gates. But it, for, as far as he was concerned, the poor man was of no significance to him. And we see something very powerful here. Even though the Bible didn't tell us whether the poor man had a relationship with God, but when he died, we discovered that actually he did have a relationship with God. Because when he died, the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom. But when the rich man died, we didn't hear anything in the scripture that tells us that he was carried to Abraham's bosom. In fact, he was buried. So clearly we can see from scripture that this poor man had a relationship with God. 
But the rich man did not have a relationship with God, even though he had plenty of possessions. But isn't that the true story of the world that we live in today, whereby we have people who are meant to be the the, the somebodies of our society who care less about the things of God? Because as far as they're concerned, they have all that they need. They have three meals every day. They're healthy. Everything's fine. So why do they need God? And even if you're not rich today, you might be thinking to yourself, but that's the rich, but I'm not rich. Yes, you might not be rich, but that story still applies to you. Because if you're living a life where you don't have time for God or things of God are not important to you, guess what? You're acting like that rich man. You're saying, I'm content with the state of my life. I have all that I need to live my life. I am in charge of my own destiny. There's no space for God in my life. Why do I need God? What has he ever done for me? But the truth of the matter is this. You might work so hard and become a somebody on this planet Earth. You might achieve great success by human definition and human standard on this planet Earth. But one day, the Bible says, it's appointed for man to die and after die, after death, the judgment. So one thing you have to bear in mind is that there's a place called the afterlife. Whether you like it, whether you believe it, whether you know about it or not, that does not change the fact that there is an afterlife. Now, I'd like to quickly point some examples that we can learn from and some realities that we can pick up from this text uh, that we just read in Luke chapter 16. Number one, notice that when the rich man died, something interesting happened. Let's have a look at that verse. So we see in verse, in verse 22, finally the poor man died. And was carried by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. And his soul went to the place of the dead, known as Hades. There in torment he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Because I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime, you had everything you wanted, and Lazarus had nothing. So now he's here, being comforted, and you are in anguish. And besides, there's a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from, there, from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. Then the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. So he was saying, even if you cannot get Lazarus to come and quench my thirst, please send Lazarus to my home. Send him back to earth. Why? So that he can warn my brothers because I have compassion. I have love for my brothers and I don't want him to experience the same fate that I'm currently experiencing. Fair enough, I made a mistake. Fair enough, I didn't have time for God while I was on earth, but my brother still have a chance and I don't want him to come here. So please send Lazarus to go and warn them. Now, the interesting thing I want to point to you is this. When we die, doesn't matter where we, you end up, whether it's heaven or hell, when you die, one thing is guaranteed. One thing is guaranteed. Number one is you will retain your personality. You will retain your personality. Number two, you will retain your memory. Look at the rich man, for example, in this text. What did he say? He says, send Lazarus to come and quench my thirst. Why? Because in his mind, he was still that rich man. Yes, he was not satisfied with his predicament. Yes, he didn't like what he was going through, but he felt entitled to command Lazarus to come and serve him. He said, send Lazarus to come and quench my thirst. He didn't say to Abraham, send somebody from over there to help me or give me a glass of water or rescue me from this place. He didn't say, please rescue me from this place. He was demanding his right. He was trying to exert his own right that he had, but he had none. But he said, send Lazarus. Because in his mind, Lazarus was a man that I knew back on earth. He was beneath me. I was superior to him based on social standards. So why should anybody, if there's anybody that should serve me, it should be Lazarus. Father Abraham, I know you are my ancestor and when you were on earth you were a wealthy man so i have respect for you so i'm not going to say abraham come and quench my thirst i will say lazarus come and quench my thirst but abraham said something very powerful to him that is not possible there's a great divide between you and and us that even if i wanted to do so i cannot do so one thing we see with the rich man is that his heart his personality had not changed it was used to 
get in his way while he was on earth and he felt even doing death he can still do the same thing and um interestingly enough just to show you how this man thinks and his personality was still intact he said okay fair enough you can't send Nazareth to come and question my thirst at the very least send him to my home in his mind Lazarus was still somebody who was beneath him he was somebody who should be used as of when he or however he feels he needs him to be used because he is the rich man after all I am here I am facing injustice I should not be where I am today but finally finally he said something very powerful he said no father Abraham but if someone is sent from here from the dead that is they will repent of their sins so after he was arrogant about feeling entitled to get um, Lazarus to quench his thirst that didn't work feeling entitled for, Ab for Abraham to send Lazarus to quench to serve him as a rich man even though it was in hell he said finally I, I give up I realize I've made a mistake I realize this I've just been so full of myself mm. so please don't let this happen to my brothers and sisters don't let this happen to my brothers rather please send somebody from here to warn them because if they see somebody who came from the dead they will repent now the word repent is very powerful for him to use the word repent means that he came to a realization that that is what is needed to save his soul that is what is needed to save his soul you see the rich man represents the world that we live in today a lot of us are chasing money we're chasing fame we're chasing social status we chase all these wonderful things and there's nothing wrong in the acquisition of nice And have money nothing wrong god wants you to have those things but the key thing here is this where are you placing your focus mm. that is the key message of this text where are you placing your focus because the rich man had everything you can imagine the bible talks about he lived in luxury not once a week every day of his life he lived in luxury now you might think to yourself but i am not a rich man you don't have to be a rich man you don't have to be a rich man for this to apply to you anybody without christ guess what when you die you become a nobody mm. is somebody in this world is somebody in this world who does not believe in god mm. is a nobody in the afterlife mm -hmm. that is a fact that you cannot ignore and if you choose to ignore it it still becomes a reality nonetheless a nobody in this world who believes in God is a somebody in the kingdom of God or in the afterlife. Because your status is not predicated upon your acquisition. Your status is not predicated upon your good works. Your status is not predicated upon your ability to exercise your right or demand your way. Your status is not predicated upon your hard work. Your status it's only predicated upon what you do with what Christ has done for you. What you do with the revelation of what Christ has done for you. On the cross of Calvary, Christ said something very powerful. He said, it is finished. Meaning, nothing more, nothing less. Nothing to be subtracted, nothing to be added. Nothing you can do to make God love you more or less. Christ said it is finished. Mm -hmm. Nothing you can do to make God give you a back door into heaven. Christ said it was finished. Mm -hmm. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. Mm -hmm. Let that sink into your mind for a moment. The rich man had plenty of possessions. Mm -hmm. The rich man was a somebody on earth. Mm -hmm. The rich man was well respected. The rich man had many servants, but in the afterlife, he didn't have one soul to quench his thirst. Mm -hmm. A man with loads of money, loads of possession in the afterlife, all he wanted was not money. He wanted somebody to just not even look. notice he didn't ask for a glass of water. He said, dip your finger just to quench my thirst he was happy and content with just a little drop of water mm. that was his predicament now i want you to understand something very powerful when christ came to earth he came in the form of man it meant he was a spirit and he is a spirit he has a body and he possesses a soul just like we do he came in the form of man and that's so significant so let's have a look at what happened when jesus died what really took place on the cross Yes, we know he died, but what actually took place, because there's something that took place that is so easily missed if we don't take our time to go through scripture. Number one, when Christ died on the cross, one of the things that took place was this. His spirit 
went to God. It said, Father, it is finished. Now, let me show you that scripture. Luke chapter 23. Let's turn there quickly. Luke chapter 23, uh, verse 46. And it reads, verse 46. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. So the first thing that happened when he died was he committed his spirit to God. So his spirit went to God. Notice I said a man is a spirit. He possesses a soul and he lives in a body. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when he came to earth, he is and was and still is a spirit. He possessed a soul and he lived in a human body. But when he died on the cross of Calvary, guess what happened? His spirit departed and went to be with the Lord. That is so significant. Now, let's have a look at what happened to the soul of Jesus. Because we don't hear much about what happened to the soul of Jesus. Because we all we hear is he died and resurrected. Which is true. But when you understand what happened to the three dimension that makes Jesus the man, man, God in man, you would appreciate what he did on the cross of Calvary. So we have already acknowledged the fact that he died. His spirit went to heaven, Luke 23, 46. Let's have a look at what happened to his soul. I'm going to read to you from the book of Acts chapter 2. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to read from verse 22 all the way down to 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 22 to 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 22 to 38. And it reads, People of Israel, listen, God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. Mm -hmm. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to the cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in his grip. Mm-hmm. King David said this about Jesus. Now, this is a prophecy that was given by King David. Mm-hmm. The Bible tells that King David was a prophet. And this is a prophet that he, uh, that, that he came up with based on the revelation that God gave him. Let's have a look at the prophecy. He says this. I see that the Lord is always with me, speaking of Jesus. Mm-hmm. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. Amen. You have shown me the way of life and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. Yes. Dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself. For he died and was buried mm-hmm. and his tomb is still here amongst us. But he was a prophet and he knew God was had promised with, with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on this throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead and we are all witness of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. For David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, what does it mean by the Lord said to my Lord? God said to Jesus, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, make them a footstool under your feet. So let any let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified mm-hmm. to be both Lord and Messiah. Mm-hmm. Peter's words pierced their hearts and they said to him and to the other apostles, mm-hmm. Brothers, what should we do? Ladies and gentlemen, I hope as you're hearing the word of the Lord today, what is coming to your heart if you don't know the Lord is, what can I do mm-hmm. to be a partaker in the finished work of Christ? Mm-hmm. What can I do to be redeemed by the precious blood of Christ? What can I do to be a child of God. That should be the thoughts in your mind. Mm-hmm. Because this is a reality that will happen. That has happened whether you choose to like it or not. Mm-hmm. Christ has finished everything that needs to be finished. He's died for your sins. He's died for my sins. Nothing I can do can make God love me more or less. 
Nothing I can do can make me justified before God. Christ mm -hmm. alone made that possible. And the only way I can be a child or become a child of God is to believe in the finished work of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, as we read on it, we'll get to see a little bit more in detail what Christ accomplished on the cross. So what happened when he died on the cross? Number one, we looked at the fact that he died on the cross and his spirit went to be with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Luke 23 verse 46 tells us that. We also saw that he died and his body, it's not his body rather, his soul, went to Hades, which is the realm of the dead. That's where the part of souls who died before Christ go to. Mm -hmm. His soul went to Hades. Remember man is a tripod being. He has a, he has a spirit, possesses a soul and lives in a body. Mm -hmm. So we clearly see from scripture, spirit of Christ went to be with the Lord. Soul of Christ went to Hades. Let's have a look at what happened to his body. So, John chapter 19. Let's go to John chapter 19 very quickly. John chapter 19. John chapter 19. And we're going to read from verse 40 to 42. John chapter 19, verse 40 to 42. And it reads, verse 40 to 42, and it reads, Following Jewish burial custom, they wrapped Jesus' body with the spices in long sheets of linen cloth. The place of crucifixion was near a garden where there was a new tomb, never used before. Verse 42, And so, because it was the day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was too close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Mm -hmm. So what happened to Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. Or should I say, what happened to Jesus? Number one, he died, confirmed by scriptures, and his spirit went to be with the Lord. Number two, he died, his soul went to Hades, confirmed by scriptures. Number three, he died and his body remained on earth, was buried. Mm -hmm. So why is that significant? That is significant because of the latter, the, the latter text I'm going to read to you shortly. Because until we get a grip of what Christ did, spirit, soul and body, we will not fully appreciate what happened on the cross. Mm -hmm. That's what happened was a great exchange. It's known as the great exchange. It's what enabled your destiny to be altered. Notice what we read earlier in the book of Luke chapter 16. The rich man and the poor man, he had plenty of possession that any man on this planet earth till today could wish for and hope for. Mm -hmm. But he was poor in the land of the living, but he was, he, was, he was rich in the land of the living, but he was poor in the land of the afterlife. He was poor in eternity. Mm -hmm. The Bible says what profits a man to gain the whole world? And lose his soul. Mm -hmm. What prompts a man to have so much accolades to his name and lose his soul? What prompts a man to be the great one on this earth and to lose his soul? The Bible talks about the life of man is fleeting. Here today, gone tomorrow. You see, one of the, the scriptures I just read to you in Luke chapter 16 is one of the scriptures that really anchored my faith as a new believer. Because I realized profoundly that the most important thing we can do whilst we're on this planet is to focus on what matters. There's nothing wrong in acquiring wealth. There's nothing wrong in being somebody or being successful. Nothing wrong with that. And by all means, go for it. But don't place emphasis on those things. Because at the end of the day, you cannot take that with you to the afterlife. At the end of the day, you cannot take your wealth with you. You cannot take your degrees with you. You cannot take your social standing with you. You cannot take your whatever you might have with you. You cannot. Naked you came, naked you go. Mm -hmm. But one thing you can take with you is this. In fact, I've discovered there's only two things you can take with you to the afterlife. And if that is so, why do we spend most of our time chasing after and placing emphasis on things that we will leave behind? Mm. What are those two things you can take with you? Number one, you can take your memory. You can take your memory. The rich man remembered what happened on earth. He felt pain in the afterlife, in eternity, in Hades. He felt pain. Why? Because he had a memory. He had emotion. He had emotions. And even Abraham alluded to the fact that, remember your life. You had everything in your life. So there was a remembrance there. Number two. The only other thing you can take, I said earlier, number one is memory. And number two is people. Yeah. But Richman went to hell by himself. Yes, he did. But Lazarus went to hell to Abraham's bosom by himself. Yes, he did. Now, when we talk about Abraham's bosom, we're talking about a temporary place that was made 
for those who died before Christ died. And Hades was a temporary place that was made for those who died before Christ died. Okay? The Bible tells in the later scriptures that we read at some point in time that basically Hades and hell will be chucked into the lake of fire. But at this point in time, because Christ had not died, guess what? There has to be a temporary place made for those who died without Christ. Now, what profits a man to gain the whole one and lose his soul? So we see the only thing you can take with you to the afterlife is your memory and people. How can you take people to you, with you? Does that mean when you're dying, you're going to say to your neighbor, okay, I'm dying, you're coming with me? No. Imagine you preach the gospel to a soul who received Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Mm. When that person dies, it's guaranteed to be with the Lord. The Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Mm. So you can take people with you. So why don't we place more emphasis on winning souls for the kingdom of God? God is, interest, God is interested in souls, not in gold. Mm -hmm. That is a fact that we must have embedded in our minds. Now, we've looked at what happened when Jesus died. We've looked at the fact that his spirit went to heaven. We've looked at the fact that his soul went to Hades. We've looked at the fact that um, his body remained on earth. Now, let's have a look at what happened when he rose. Mark chapter 9, verse 31. Before I go into that, one of the things I would just want to share with you to emphasize what happened when he rose is this. Number one, when Christ rose, the significance of that is this. The word of God was fulfilled. Let's go to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verse 31. Mark chapter 9, verse 31, and it reads. Mark chapter 9, verse 31, and it reads. Let me stop on verse, verse 30. Mark chapter 9, verse 30 to 31, and it reads. Live in that region. They traveled through Galilee. Jesus didn't want anyone to know he was there. Uh, it was there. Let's, sorry, Jesus didn't want anyone to know he was there, for he wanted to spend more time with his disciples and teach them. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed, but three days later, he will rise from the dead. What happened when Christ rose? Scriptures was fulfilled. The word of God was was fulfilled. Why is that so important? That is so important because if he said he was going to die, and if he said he was going to rise, and he did, then guess what? What everything else he said after that, we can trust. Everything he said, we can trust. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. We can trust that because he said he would die, he rose. If Christ never rose from the grave, if all he did was die, then it's no different than anybody else who died before him. But the significance in the death of Christ was that he rose. And still lives forever and ever. Amen. So let's have a look at what else took place when Christ rose from the dead. What else? Let's have a look at First Peter. First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. We'll have to see what the Bible has to tell us about that. First Peter chapter 3. The first Peter chapter 3, uh, I'm going to read from verse 18 to 22. We're looking at what happened when Christ rose from the dead. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18 to 22, and it reads, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from the drowning in that terrible flood. Who are those eight people? Noah and his wife. Noah's two sons and, and two of his wives. So Noah and his wife, Noah's two sons and their wives. And Noah's, uh, wives, uh, Noah's son's wife's children. Those are the eight people that were that we're referring to in the scripture. So let's go back to verse 19. So he went and preached to the spirit in prison. Those who disobeyed God along those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building the boat. Only eight people were saved from the drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. 
it is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Yeah. What happened when Christ rose from the grave? Number one, the word of God was fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Or should I say the word of God was confirmed. Mm -hmm. Number two, it redeemed us back to God. How did it redeem us? Yes, you can say it saved you. Yes, it did. But it did much more than that. How did it redeem you? It redeemed you spirit, soul, and body. Mm. How did Jesus Christ and Savior redeem you? It redeemed you spirit, mm -hmm. soul, and body. Remember when we started this teaching, we said, we found the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, that man is spirit, soul, and body. Jesus came to earth as spirit, soul, and body. So if he redeemed you by your spirit only, if he redeemed your spirit only, guess what? The job is not finished. If he redeemed your spirit and your soul, the job is still not finished. If he redeemed just your body, the job is still not spirit. Why? Because what makes man, man, is the three components we just talked about. Spirit, soul, and body. So he had to redeem you spirit, soul, and body. He had to pay the price for your spirit, you have to pay the price for your soul. You have to pay the price for your body. And the Bible talks about when we resurrect, we will be resurrect with a new body. Why? Because Christ paid the price for your body. Amen. He paid the price for your glorious body that you will one day wear. Hallelujah. Amen. He paid the price for your soul. How did he pay the price for your soul? For his death and resurrection. It is because of his death and resurrection that you can have your mind renewed. Without that, your soul cannot be renewed. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. How can we be transformed if there's no provision for the transformation? Christ did that. Never forget that. And he renewed your spirit, man. Not, not only renewed your spirit, man, he actually gave you a brand new spirit. How did that come about? Because he died. Not because he died, he died and he rose. Without the resurrection, you cannot have a new spirit. Without the resurrection, you cannot have your soul to be renewed. Without the resurrection, your body can you can you have no promise whatsoever of a, new, of a glorious glorious body. The resurrection did that. So when you celebrate an Easter, please bear this in mind. It's not just a day to clap your hands and eat some eggs. It's a day to really appreciate that which God has done. He saved you. Fully. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Now, let's have a look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. I'm going to read from... Uh, I'm going to read from verse... Let's have a look. It says, your spirit, soul, and body. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Romans chapter 6. I'm going to read from verse 4 to 11. Romans chapter 6, verse 4 to 11, just to bring this home. Verse 4 to 11, and it reads, For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we also will be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its grip, its power in our lives. Mm -hmm. We are no longer slaves to sin. Mm -hmm. For when we died with Christ, so sorry, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Mm -hmm. And since we died with Christ, we also know we will also live in him. We also we are so we are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead. Notice that I said without the resurrection, there is no hope. If Christ died and did not resurrect, then he just goes into the pages of history. But because he resurrected, that's why we have a hope. Notice what it says in verse 9. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead. Okay. And he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. Okay. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now he lives, he lives for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. So you also should consider yourself to be dead to the power of sin mm -hmm. and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Mm -hmm. This is what God has done for you and me. 
This is the price that Christ paid for you and me. Mm -hmm. I'd like to take this moment to just recollect um, some of the things we've covered. A somebody in this world who does not believe in God is a nobody in the next life. Mm -hmm. A somebody in the world today who does not believe in God is a nobody in the next life that's to come. Mm -hmm. A nobody in the world today who believes in God is a somebody in the kingdom of God or should I say in the next life to come? Mm. Where is your focus? Where is your focus? You're not saved or made right by your accomplishments or social status. Only faith in the finished work of Christ. Mm -hmm. What did Christ do for you on the cross? He died on the cross for you. Mm. So that you could be made alive. What did Christ do on the cross? He redeemed you back to the Father. He redeemed the relationship you lost in the garden. Mm -hmm. What did Christ do for you on the cross? He made a way where there seemed to be no way. Mm -hmm. I want you to understand that the parable I read to you in Luke chapter 16 is not just a parable, but you know a parable is a story used to illustrate the biblical truth. Mm -hmm. So God has shown us a picture of what happens in the afterlife if we have the wrong focus. Mm -hmm. He's not saying don't be rich. He's not saying don't work hard to acquire the things that you need on earth. But he's saying make God number one. Mm -hmm. In your getting, make God number one. Mm -hmm. In your aspiration, make God number one. Oh, I want to have a big house. Make God number one. Mm -hmm. Oh, I want to be a wealthy person. Make God number one. Because don't lose that focus. Because when you lose that focus, guess what? You'll be acting like that rich man. Mm -hmm. And we saw what happens to the rich man. Mm -hmm. Many people are living their lives racing 100 miles per hour to hell because of wrong focus but god is merciful and loving that he wants to shield us away from that hence why he's given us his word so we can realign our focus i want to encourage you in this time that we're celebrating the death and resurrection of our lord jesus christ to realign your focus ask yourself where is my focus is my focus on the things of this earth or is my focus on pleasing the master, the savior? Jesus, God said it once. He said it, he said it very plainly. He said, no man can serve two masters. Nobody can. The rich man said the master of wealth. The poor man said the great I am. When he died, he received a reception that was befitting for a king. But when the rich man died, he was treated lower than a pauper. Where is your focus? It's a question you must ask yourself because you and I, before Christ came, we were like the rich man. For those of you who are Christian today, I want you to know that before Christ came, you were like the rich man on your highway to hell. On the highway to hell. But because of what Christ did, and listen, this is so important. If Christ never came, the best of us is still hopeless. The best of us is still on his way or she's still on her way to hell. Mm -hmm. But because of what Christ did on the cross, he created a diversion. Mm. Remember you drive on the road and tell you all of a sudden, stop, there's a diversion. Take another route. That's what Christ did. Mm -hmm. Many are on their way to hell because they've made the God of this world their focus. Mm -hmm. Easter is the day that we celebrate the day love came down. The day our destiny was altered and the day hope was given to mankind. So please understand that this is not just a day for you to eat eggs and just sit down and just go with the tradition of Easter. No, it's a day for you to sit down and realign your life, reassess your walk with the Lord, reassess what's important with you when it comes to your relationship with God reassess whether you value your relationship with God or whether you undervalue your relationship with God because no man knows when you breathe your last breath nobody knows and if you're listening to me right now you think to yourself I've heard about this Jesus but I've never really considered or even entertained the gospel the opportunity is now I like to repeat after me Father God I know that I'm a sinner I know that without you I'm hopeless and I know that you are the answer. Lord, forgive me for my sins. I turn away from my sins. I repent for my sins. I ask you to come into my life and be my Lord and be my Savior. Lord, this day of 
This is the celebration that we are celebrating today. It's a reminder of what you've done for me on the cross. You saved me, spirit, soul, and body. And I thank you for it. Come into my life. Save me. Help me to be a better man. Help me to be a better woman. I accept you as my Lord and Savior today. For in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you said that prayer and you said it in faith, guess what? God has written your name in the book of life. And what that means is you will receive the same reception the beggar received when he died. You have a hope and a future that's beyond what you can, what you can think of. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. The Bible is very clear. Your last breath on earth is your first breath in eternity. There's nothing to fear. Just keep moving in the right direction. Find a good church that you can be part of. Learn the word of God. And just let God lead you day by day. Easter is the day that love came down. A day we celebrate what God has done for us. A day that we celebrate the resurrection of our Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord. Because the interesting thing that we see that the devil, in his mind, he saw Christ, tempted Christ. He was convinced that Christ had died. So it was over. I've defeated him. Yeah. But unknown to the devil, all he did was kill Jesus. Because when they killed Jesus, Christ stepped outside of Jesus. Christ went to build the Lord. His soul went to Hades to set the captives free. And his body remained on earth. But then when the third day came, Christ came back into the body of Jesus and was resurrected, not only as Jesus, not only as Christ, but as Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So I want to encourage you to understand that you have a hope doesn't matter what your life looks like right now. You have a hope. And the hope that you have is not the hope of man. It's what we call an unfading hope. And of the lasting hope. And I just want to encourage you to remain with the Lord and continue to just grow in the Lord. And you see God do mighty, mighty things in your life. So have a fantastic Easter. Celebrate with your friends and family. And God bless you.